Hey, found this alone. Come on in. Like, share, subscribe. Hey, what's up, Miss Beverly? You can go ahead and call in now. You can get it go and get it cracking now. Like, share, subscribe, everybody. We letting the wise sister speak tonight. Peace and black power. Hi, how are you? Hello, Miss Beverly. How you doing? How you doing, sister? Let me turn you up in this audio. All right, go ahead and let's speak. Let me hear you. Can you hear me, Miss Beverly? Uh, there you go. Excuse me, I didn't hear you. There you go. I'm just trying to make sure your audio is up good. Uh, okay. Yeah, doing, so, a, doing a sound check you know, right quick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Good. Very good. Uh, the people in the room, let's do a sound check. Press 1 if you can hear Miss Beverly loud and clear. Shalom to you in the room. All right. I, I think see... I'm the only one there. Huh? I think I'm the only one in there. Uh, it says oh, it's got no. four people there. Yeah, Eddie Thomas, Shalom, Shalom. Audio's good. All right. Well, let me give you an introduction, Miss Can- Miss uh, Miss Beverly, and what Miss Candy. Also, I was saying her name just now. I dropped off my lips. <laughs> uh, if you even want to bring her in or whoever, whatever you want to do tonight, this is your show. Like I said, there's no censorship here. Whatever wisdom you want to bring to us, we're here. As sponges, and we're gonna soak it up. And I want y'all in this in this in the room to like, share, and subscribe. Send this out, send this to the sisters. Let the sisters know that there is a wise sister speaking tonight. Mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. So, like, share, subscribe, and we're gonna have this put on the main channel as soon as this uh is over so that all of the, all of the audience can see it. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be a great one. All right, so this is this is Sister Beverly. I met Sister Beverly through Hassan Campbell's show, and uh, shout out to you, Hassan. Talked to Hassan earlier, and uh, I think Hassan knows you're on. And in a second, when I stop running my mouth, I'm gonna start sharing, and I'll send it out to a, a couple people. Okay. Yeah. So I met Sister Beverly through associating with Hassan Hassan Campbell's show. So y'all like, share, and subscribe to Hassan Campbell. And real talks, real topics with Hassan. Subscribe to Black News 102, and definitely subscribe to RBG Hebrew 2, RBG Hebrew 4, and follow me on Instagram. And before you start, Miss Beverly, I'd love for you to go ahead and give your your uh, social media information out and anything that you want to promote. Give that, and then light us up. Okay, so, I don't know, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, uh, let me see, I don't even know where to start. This is new to me, but... Um, <laughs> be, uh, be yourself, be comfortable, <laughs> tell us whatever. You know, no, I just, um, uh, I don't, I guess I'm getting a little tongue-tied on this one before, but once I get started, no, I was just, um... I'm just an ordinary person. I was born and raised in uh, New Jersey.
Jersey in a little town called Paddington, which is like 20 minutes away from New York. Uh. From the Bronx, New York. So, uh, it's 30 minutes from Newark, New Jersey. It's the third largest, third largest city in the state of New Jersey, in the northern part of New Jersey. Right on. Right Come on. from ordinary broken parents. Mother, mother and father. Mother went to fifth grade. Father went to third grade. They, um, products, you know, products of their time, of the old South. Mm-hmm. There, but, uh, I, I'm the same. I'm the same way. Let me interject, Miss Beverly. I'm the same way. My family is rooted in the South, and even um, farmers that are, you know, uh, connected with my family, they still run in their farms and feeding their families in the South today, 2018, through that land. So, yeah, I feel you when you say your roots, family roots, are from the South. Go ahead, sis. Family roots in the South, very um, not um. Not college educated, but very educated to life, I guess you would say. Mm. And I see Miss Tina Glenn is in in there. In there. Yeah. So, how you doing, Tina Glenn? Peace and to you, Tina Glenn. Pineal Glenn, peace to you. Peace to Eddie Thomas yes. also. And yes. And anyway, just, just I come from an ordinary family. I come from a biracial background mm -hmm. and a uh, lot of the things a lot of things the uh, I grew up grew up with I, I don't know I just don't know where to go with I don't know how to go with that but um okay let me ask I you some questions let me ask you some questions would that would that help out because I want I got a couple questions yeah. I want to ask so the, the, the people can understand definitely who they're speaking with and that those are good because the South and let me let me remind my listeners the South is where most of all of our families in the West and the East and the North and in the Midwest they all migrated there. My family migrated up north to Detroit from Louisiana. Shalom to the people in the room, Miss Candy. Shalom to you. Shalom, Pioneer Glass. Shalom, Eddie Thomas. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my family, like I said, like Sister here said, my family grew up. Or came up in the south and migrated north, and then spread it out from there. So, um, let me ask you this, Miss Beverly. You said that you have a biracial background, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, um, how how do you how do you see the the wisdom from having both both races in, in, employed in your life? How how does that help you as a mother or as a grandmother? How has it helped you? Your 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 unique experience of having both sides of that social uh, experience. Well, actually, um, the being biracial, um, it it comes because my my father, my grandfather on my father's side was white, mm. but there's a lot of undertones to it. Right, right. right. As, you know, it's, it's a lot of undertone. I don't know that side of the family. I have no desire to know that side of the family. Right. I have an older sister because, uh, from what I was told, uh, my my father and his siblings had a very a very harsh background with that because mm. they were it was I think it was seven or eight of them I don't know I'm not even sure wow. but they had a harsh background with that because both my parents had what you could say very dysfunctional families, uh, dysfunctional families. My mother's father left, left her, and uh, she grew up without her father. She had a stepfather. My father and his siblings were all giving away. It was just because of the South. Mm -hmm. It was, I, I can't really say it was a rape or anything, mm -hmm. but it his mother, his mother was my grandmother. She was, she had a, she was, um, she was had a white father and uh, black mother, and and she had her children, and she gave all of her children away. But I think it was a product of what they came from, because uh, my mother was born in nineteen ten, mm -hmm. my father was born in nineteen oh eight. So you know the situation they came from as far as being black. Absolutely. In North Carolina, in Virginia, 
And uh, so, I, I, I don't know my father's side of the family. Now, I have an older sister who's almost 10 years older than me. She's all into it. I, I don't care to be into it. Yeah, I, I know my mother's family, her mother's family, you know, her right. mother's family, and that's all I care about. I'm not. I'm not racist or anything like that, but I just, it just, I don't care to know. I don't know. I feel if you can, if you give your children away, you won't want to know the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just me. My, my, my uncle, blonde hair, blue eyes, but they always identified as black. black. They're classified as mulatto. Right. And yeah. it, it just brought a lot of it just brought a lot of problems to me. Yeah, I think which, it. I think I it felt wasn't worth it. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm I think we all and and to be honest, I, let me let me be honest and raise my hand. My my immediate um, predecessors, my immediate ancestors, my grandmother was a mulatto. She was half white, half black, right? But the, the reason that I wanted to bring that out is because truly it, it brings a point of commonality, not just between you and myself, but between you, myself and all of our brothers and sisters that may have a bad grip on what racial empowerment or racial pride is. And truly racial pride don't have to be prejudice. You know what I'm saying? I think I think being prejudiced and being judgmental to the tune that we won't allow people of other races to be honest, be truthful, and even help us in our causes or whatever, in social causes or political settings. I think that's a mistake that black people made in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s because of the, their necessity to live that way. But today, uh, really, truly, we're all mixed to a certain, certain great degree. And my, my uh, affinity towards black power and RBG culture it's simply because of that what I identify as and my struggle. And I'm sure this sister can identify with the same things. Now, here's another question, Ms. Beverly. What do you see in New Jersey? Uh, and and am, I, am I saying it right? New Jersey, right? Right. What do you see in New Jersey in the way of multiracial social settings as far as what as you came up was accepted and what is accepted today. What is your opinion on some of that stuff? Like the hip hop culture, like um, the hair culture, you know, the beauty health care uh, culture. Because our, our women, it seems like are being just destroyed through that financially and socially and even mentally. So what, what do you see out there where you're at and, and how, well, do you, how do you see any of that morphing badly? Well, going back to when I was growing up, because I grew up in the, uh, I grew up in the, the 60s. For one thing, for me, for me, it was um, the Black Power movement came out in what y'all call the conscious community now. Mm. I never fit into that. Yeah. Never fit, never fit into it. Yeah, it was new to before me too time. before eight years ago. I had never heard of Sidenetta and some of these cats out here. I was like, I was amazed. Because <laughs> I was a church boy well, and a street Negro, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Yeah, Beverly. I grew up in the church, definitely grew up in the church. And I grew up in a, a, a southern, old conservative southern Baptist church, mm. church and a Catholic background, Catholic Baptist background. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of weird. It was it was kind of weird. My my childhood was I didn't fit I didn't fit in with certain black people. I didn't fit in with like okay, the, I call it the conscious community, but the black power movement. I just didn't fit in with those. They didn't accept me mm. because for one thing, they saw my my aunt, my uncle, my father, and things like that. So I didn't set it with that. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a, I've always been a black, a conscious of 
conscious, a black conscious person of being black. I've always accepted it. I've never tried to be anything but what I am. Right and even today, I get, I get it where, where I um, I get where um, oh, you're not black and stuff like that. So I grew up with a lot of that. And uh, I was told I was different, which I always never felt different. But then again, as I got older, and even now, I realized that I did grow up a lot different from the people I was around because I grew up with a mother and a father. Mother and father were married for damn near almost four uh, Actually, they were married for almost 50 years. My mother died. Wow. And so they were married for 50 years. And, uh, wow. you know, it was just two kids. And they were the biracial couple, not not necessarily that your, your biracial came through generations, but your mother and father were the biracial? That My um, my father was, and my, my great-grandfather on my mother's side, I... To be honest, I never got it. I never got into it because it never impressed me. Yeah, it never amazed me because I know I was just never. In, I was never into it. But no, let me people, ask you this. Oh, go ahead. Finish your thought, Mr. Beverly. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that. Just people made me more aware of my of um, my of my biracial background mm-hmm. more so than I. That I that I was into it because mm-hmm. it didn't face me like that. I always identify because my father's people they always identify as, as black. I have one aunt. Uh, he has one sister that's living. She's about she's almost a hundred years old. Wow. So, and if you were to talk to her, she'll tell you she's black. Yes, indeed. You know, so it, it it's it's what other people it's what other people did, and I have. I had long hair, long hair, long coarse hair. They was it, it. It was just like it was like the bullying thing. Mm. The bullying thing, you know. Oh, you're not black. You're you're not black. You're white. You just trying to pass for black. I'm like, wow. it is. I'm not gonna lie. It bothered me when I was growing up, you know. And I had like two worlds I had to live in because mm. I had to navigate through going through the hood wow you know i had to navigate through going through there but when i went in but when i went inside my house it was like going to a middle class family you know mother father two kids yes i'm my father my sister and i are my father's only two children and my mother's only two children Mm. they both had children with each other that's it Right, right you know so I didn't, you know, and I went through, I went through a lot. My mother, uh, my mother got sick when I was um, young, when I was young, and uh, there was, at, at the beginning, they, there was talk of putting us in foster care, but my grandmother came, wow. my mother's mother came, wow. and she took care of us, she raised, took care of me until I was 10, wow. she died, and then a lot of things. A lot of things changed because um, I was paying a mortgage at ten years old. What? I was cooking. I was doing. Oh, hold on, hold, hold on, sister. hold on, Miss Beverly. Wait a minute. Hit that again. Back, back up. Now you said that. Now, number one, n- notably, you said that your your grandmother came and picked y'all up because y'all was going to be put into the you know the, the state systems and whatnot, not to get adopted and stuff. Right. And that's a great point to point out. For the sisters that's out here, look at the morphology of our social construct here that Miss Beverly's speaking about. That was a common thing, just like even this uh, multiracial thing. Families taking on their grandchildren as children. Now, that don't happen a lot today. It only happens with the older sisters that are still surviving today, but that's something that's to be said about that generation of women that's strong and refuse to let their generations and families be split up like that. That's powerful about your sister, I mean your grandmother picking picking y'all up. But you said you were paying a mortgage at 10. And I want to talk about the mortgage thing because that's another thing that a lot of people don't see today. 
that most of us in black America, young black people under 40, most of us don't own houses. But most of our grandfathers and grandmothers and parents own their houses. And that's a problem. But go ahead and tell us how in the world was you working at that age and the issue with the mortgage paying? Go ahead, hit that. So, I was, when I said I was paying the mortgage, my dad, my, now my dad always worked. I mm. never saw, I didn't see my dad much when I was growing up because he always worked. Woo. But I was given after my grandmother, after my grandmother died, because she died when I was 10 years old. So, the things that she used to do, like go downtown, pay the bills and things like that, I picked them up. I don't know if you know this, but the sock. It's a thing with a sock and a pen. They would pin money on you. Oh, when yeah. you were a kid, they would take it and put it in the sock and pin it on you yeah. and tell you where to go. Yes. And pay who to see, who to ask for. And don't unpin. Don't, don't touch that sock. sock until, <laughs> yeah. until you get me your government. And don't give, it, don't give the money to anybody <laughs> but who they tell you to give it to. Yo, Miss Beverly, I got to. Oh, hold on. Let me put my input in here. My grandmother. She not only had that, and she used to do that, but she used to keep her, in her personal purse, she would keep a sock inside of a small penny bag, the penny bag inside of another sock, and the sock would have uh, the, the safety pins on it. So, it, like, we go to the mailbox. M my grandmother would dig in her purse and just take 20 minutes to get, you know, <laughs> because, you know, she really, you know, she was really protective of all the things that she had. But even in that, you know, training the children on how to take messages and keep that sock closed is very important because I don't think our kids now is, is strong enough mentally to do that. They so nosy, so disrespectful. They bust a letter open, read it on the way to the mat, to the destination. But yeah, that oh, I, I feel you on that. <laughs> no, no, I took the. I, it was ten on me. I did that, and uh, wow. I, I I did laundry. I cooked mm. at a young age. At I a young at age. A really young age. Very young age. Actually, <laughs> I started cooking. People don't believe me when I say this, but I actually started cooking when I was five years old, stood wow. on a stool. That's what they did back then. Wow. And today, what, like, me being at a stove, and I had stoves that you strike a match. You know, the old stoves, you had to yeah. strike a match and stuff. Sure, and I, I remember the wood stoves, Miss Beverly, my grandmother. <laughs> wood one. I remember the wood stoves. Yes, I remember. Uh, yeah, we had a coal wood stove. And we had a, with gas and uh, with coal wood. It, it it was crazy, but um, yeah. So what what I did at a young age would be considered abuse now. Wow. It would be considered child abuse now, but wow, that's what they did back then. Mm, and that was preparation, though. And what she's saying is preparation, young training, and even making a young person be accountable, even to that degree. Today, it would be called abuse, but truly. That's simply training, cause I can I can guarantee you, Miss Beverly taught many people how to cook, and fed many people in her in her family and lifetime here. <laughs> yeah, yes, my grandmother was a great cook. Down when my grandmother lived, it was when she was living, she took care of it. Now my father also took care of my grandmother. He took care of his mother. Mm. So it was a big thing. Powerful. It was a big thing that family. He, you know, took care of his um his mother and uh, stuff like that. And my grandmother until, like I said, until she died, I did. They she taught me how to cook and everything. Also, you know, she was big on the church, mm -hmm. which you know, all back then that's what it was. Taught she taught them be respectful and. You know, different things like that. Big on home remedies, big on castor oil, which mm. I hate. Big on castor oil, big on eating <laughs> right. Is have you ever had food? Never going out. Have you ever had shalom Warford, Shalom to you. Have you ever had cod liver oil? 
when you was younger? Yes, I have. What's worse, I castor? Which, what's worse, Miss Beverly, castor oil or cod liver oil? All of them. All of them. <laughs> I, I could I could <laughs> take none. I could take none of them. They, <laughs> it's like this time of Easter. Yeah, when you out for Easter break, you die to make you eat the eggs. Easter and Halloween was the worst uh, for me. Yeah. Because you got a dose of castor oil because the castor oil would keep you from getting worms. Uh, worms uh. were very bad when I was growing up. But I just realized because Penal Gland did a video about the hookworms and the tapeworms and stuff. Wow. And my grandmother would give us castor oil. Like three days, she let you eat it. But before you went back to school, you got a big dose of castor, castor oil. oil. And I used to run because every time it hit the bottom of my stomach, it would shoot out my mouth like a rock. And I, <laughs> I hate castor oil. You know, <laughs> you know what I hated about that? You know what I hated about castor oil and cod liver oil? You could taste it after you burp days later you you burp yes. two days later and you can taste that castor oil like you just had it that morning and i got i got all of that because i have asthma i have asthma and it was really bad when i was growing up wow because uh, it goes by the weather you know the cold weather and stuff like that excuse me and um i got it bad i got cod liver oil and orange juice Every morning before mm. I went to school, every Ooh. single morning. Wow! And my grandmother, she would get up and she would cook, and we would eat. We she make wheat tina, which I hate. What is it farina, called? Wheat tina? I oh, farina! Hate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Farina and wheat tina, something called. Wheat tina. <laughs> she just cook all of that. She cooked, and she, oh, it was um, oh. It's just terrible. Back after all of them are bad, and she gives something, something called Grover's Tasteless Chill Tonic, wow. and uh, Father John's with a big lump of sugar, black licorice <laughs> with a big lump of sugar. Just, just terrible stuff. Woo! But then, uh, let me ask you this: yeah, Now, did you did you have a lot of? Uh, now you said make sure that the, the the worms and stuff is dealt with with the cod liver oil. But were you a sick no, with, the, uh, castor oil. with the castor oil? I'm sorry, castor oil. You now were you a sickly child? Other than the asthma, did you catch flus and stomach viruses every year, every six months? Uh, no. Basically, it was for me. It was just the weather. Yeah. Uh, asthma, and if I got a chest cold, no. Nah. And I have bad case of tonsillitis. I have bad case of tonsillitis. No. Bad, bad, bad. I had to. They put me out of school. I had to actually get my tonsils taken out because wow. um, I was underweight and it was, I was all of that. Mm. I was a little. I was a little mess. Now I, I got to be true. I was a little mess because I was that. I was that kid that when all of us was together. Every time something happened, they'd be like, my grandmother would be like, who did it? And everybody said, they called me Pungus. They put Pungus did it. <laughs> and she snatched me up. And I was always that one that had to go go with her. Because, you know, there's always one kid that got to follow follow around everybody. But um, Now, let me, let, yeah. me, let me point this out. The worms that you were talking about. That you that you were being given that castor oil, Miss <laughs> Candy says she never had castor oil, and it's a monster, Cap Candy. I'm telling you, <laughs> but it works. It works, and it does not yeah. have adverse effects that will hit you like ten years later, like some of these drugs they give now. This experimental stuff, they tell you take this and then come back if you have suicidal issues. Come back if you if you you're seeing lights and dizzy and stuff. Come back if you can't eat, you know. But this castor oil and cod liver oil, cod liver oil, mind you, you guys, is a fish oil made from fish. And I did a lecture a long time ago, and I talked about even in the in the apocrypha in the Old Testament, there's a reference to fish oils and omega three fatty acids. Now, these things are becoming deficits in the diet of this generation. Miss Ke Miss Miss Beverly is here saying that she got this cod liver oil all the time for specific things, but again, 
she wasn't sickly to the tune that you have today, children. She had maladies, like she said, asthma, and you know a couple other things. But I'm talking about these kids today get sick three times a week and can't go to school. Even these kids in my house, because they love sodas and they just eat anything. And I try to snatch all of that out their hands when I see it, but they get it anyway. And I'm saying all of that to say this: those natural um, element, elements they gave us when we were younger needs to be revisited in this generation because we don't have not only children with worms but we got adults with worms when we listen to Dr. Sebi and all the stuff Dr. Sebi gave us before he made his transition God bless the brother rest his soul rest in power but Dr. Sebi talked about the worms and the toxins and all of the mess that builds up in our stomachs. But this stuff, castor oil, castor oil will make you poo if you drink uh, cheese. If you drink, <laughs> you, you, I, don't, I don't see anybody cast, constipated that takes castor oil. And constipation, that, uh -huh, constipation that's what it was for. You see that? The That's sugar. Right. That was to get the sugar out of your body. That's the right. Sugar, the sugar was what caused worms. That's right. The kids that came up from down south years ago. That's right. Like they came up from the farms, the sharecroppers, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They came up with worms. See that? They came up with worms, uh, hook worms, tape worms, had all ring of worms. Ooh. All kind of worms. They had worms. They had all kind of worms when I was growing up. Wow. And so, so and, she would give that. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know, my grandmother was holistic. She believed what what they call holistic medicine now. She believed in, um, she didn't believe in the doctor. Speak but that. I think that came from, because you know, black people did, couldn't go to the doctor. So she uh, was, had to uh, make it. That's would, right. She would make, uh, she would make this tea. Like squeeze these lemons. I remember she would squeeze lemons in a pot Hot and tight. boil the peels until they become soft. Ooh. And you could actually see the lemon oil on top of the water. Um, and then she would sweeten it up to taste and get you to drink it. And that was the cough syrup mm -hmm. because I, I had a lot of congestion and mucus, and it would make make me cough it up. That's she right. Didn't, we didn't do cough syrup. That's we right. Didn't do cough syrup. No doctors, my mother Nothing. used to call that hot toddy and they used to change the well, formula a lot of times yeah <laughs> look look now now let me get it all let me let me tell you this one my mama told me that now and i gonna be honest now some of the like like the sister saying here that they had to be home remedists home doctors give your write your own script at home and make sure it's holistic holistic not uh, FDA approved uh, but uh, <laughs> my mother told me that my grandfather and them they used to get sometimes so desperate because they would not have the money you know my mother uh, actually was one of the last generations of people in my family that I know with my grandmother that worked in the field and they actually lived as sharecroppers in the south my grandmother and my grandfather they were literally sharecroppers like free slaves you know what I'm saying and so they didn't have a lot of money they didn't have a lot of anything they didn't have a lot of transportation a lot of anything so man my mother said my grandmother used to get desperate sometime and she would get goddamn kerosene Miss Beverly and give them <laughs> <laughs> Give yeah, them a teaspoon of kerosene, or 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 even <laughs> or even I, uh, Vicks Vicks vapor rub. My grandfather did this one to me now one time. Yes, Warfin brother, I'm telling you. Sometimes when you get down bad like that in the condition that our elders were in, and they didn't have, they had to make do. And sometimes that shit sounds crazy, but really. My grandfather did this one. I'm going to let Miss Candy, I mean, Miss, I keep calling Miss Candy. You need to get in here too. Um, but Miss Beverly, I'm going to let Miss Beverly uh, go on. But my grandfather, I was sick. I remember I was real sick. I think I was like maybe 17. And we went and picked my grandfather up. This is how I ended up living with my grandfather. 
he was living in Kentwood, Louisiana. That's right where, where Britney Spears is from, I believe, right next to Mississippi. And uh, my grandfather had been the type of person that was like a hermit. He had not left Kentwood in 20 to 30 years when I met him. So me and my mom went and got him, you know, because we came from Detroit and, and she hooked up with her family. We got my grandfather to the house in, the, um, you know, urban rural area that we was living in on the North Shore. And my grandfather came with all types of stuff. I never knew. I had a dog one time. I'm going to get to it and get out the way. I had a dog and I was trying to make the dog's tail fall off like they do Doberman Pinchers. But I was young and crazy. So I put the rubber band on the dog tail. The dog tail got so infected, the dog's tail swole up as big as my arm, family. And the dog was about to die. My grandfather said, boy, I don't know what in the world wrong with you. He said, go get that dog. My grandfather got the dog. He gave the dog a little peanut butter on his fingers. And by the time the dog finished licking the peanut butter, I heard pop. It was like a crack, like a stick broke. My grandfather took his knife while the dog was licking the peanut butter. He popped the dog's tail off. The dog didn't even holler. The dog healed up. And the, uh, after the bleeding, the bleeding, the bleeding, my grandfather took motor oil out of the, the little container that we was using to change cars and stuff. Took motor oil, rubbed it on the dog's tail, and told me that motor oil not only will help wounds heal, and keep parasites from living. He told me that motor oil will cure dog mange. And Israel Doctrine, you need to hear this. Because you got mange. <laughs> 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 Woo, you got mange, boy. Now I'm telling you, my grandfather gave me the remedy. He said, take that oil and soak it. Soak, soak the dog and the human dog, the two-legged dog or four-legged dog. Soak them with that. And what the oil do is it suffocates the parasites. The oil don't do anything healthy for the because the dog can actually die if they lick that. You know what I'm saying? So you got to monitor them and make sure it's not too much. But it kills parasites, skin parasites. And man, I learned that. And I learned to never put no damn uh, rubber band on the dog's tail. That veterinarians and my grandfather chopped the tails off. Now, I said all of that to say this. That same man told me when I had a flu, I mean bad, the man said, go get me some of that Vicks Vapor Rub. And I said, Grandpa, I don't, I don't want to put that on my chest because when I put that on my chest, then you got to get under the cover. And I don't want to stay under that cover all night sweating. He said, don't worry about that. All you're going to have to do is go sit down. He got the Vicks Vapor Rub from me, dipped his pinky finger in there, and he'd say, open your mouth. I said, Grandpa, I'm about to go. <laughs> he said, come here, boy. I let him do it. I trusted him. He's, uh, he said, open my mouth. Open my mouth. I opened my mouth. He took the Vicks and put it on the back of my tongue. Closed my mouth. He said, swallow. I swallowed. Fucking Vicks vapor rub. Mentholatum. You hear me? Yeah. Well, guess what happened the next day? I went to school. You hear me? Breathing clear. <laughs> I had it. <laughs> I've had the Vicks tea, Vicks in the tea, and all of that. Wow. They, they See? Did all of that. See? I lived with my grandmother down south Woo. before I started school. And um, and I was sitting on a chair. It was an old chair, and I was sitting with, uh, straddling the chair like a, a man, like a guy. They told me not to do it. Uh -huh. I was always doing something I ain't had no business doing. The chair broke. My hand, well, my head and my hand hit the cast iron heater. Mm. The cold stove. One of those pot belly cold stoves that my aunt had in the, um, that had in the house. And when, when I took my hands off of it, it pulled the skin oh. off. My skin was stuck to the stove. And, uh, Ooh, I mean, it, it was bad. I, I cried. I cried. My hands swelled up. I had blisters. She took the octagon soap, the brown octagon soap, heated it up in hot water, wow. made a paste, and put sugar, and pasted it all on my hands and tied my hands up. And I cried. I was in pain. So every Friday night, my father would call me, 8 o'clock. 
like clockwork. Uh. I got a call from my father, and I told I told my mother what happened, and my mother told my father told her to that he was gonna send some money, wire her some money, so she could bring me back and take me to the doctor. But she put this paste on my hand with the sugar. And the neck when I got, when they took it off, it was like a shell. The sugar had melted and got hard and made like a shell. So when they brought me back to Jersey, when she brought me back to Jersey, my mother took me to the doctor. Wow. And the doctor looked at my hands and he said, well, I don't know what your mother did <laughs> for her, but let her continue. There was no infection, no Damn. infection, nothing. I have, I have two scars on my head. I got burned on my forehead, but um, wow. it's I don't even have a scar from that. But she, my grandmother was into all of that. She wow. went outside in our backyard, and uh, cobweb. She never let us take them down. Spiderweb. She never let mm-hmm. us take them down. Mm-hmm. I cut my foot, Stop and she, that blood. spiderweb went outside in the tree, got the spiderweb, and laid it on my toe, and it mm. stopped bleeding. Stop the blood. So, a cobweb. You know, she was into that. We Damn. don't do that anymore. We don't, you know, we don't do any of that anymore. And you so. know, a lot of that, a lot of that, much of that, I mean, probably the great majority of all of our uh, our ancestors' home remedies and stuff have been stolen and mimicked in the modern, uh, you know, the medicine industry and with the FDA and all this stuff. And they steal it and they make it really dangerous, you know what I'm saying? But they steal the premise. And I'm telling you that that's like a whole list of <laughs> home remedies. We we got cod liver oil, castor oil, Vicks vapor rub. Uh, what what, what did you say? A, co- a cobwebs. What what cobwebs else did you? Cobwebs on a cut. A spider web on a cut. Uh huh. What did you say about the burn? The burn. What what was the ingredients in the that? The burn. She took octagon soap. Octagon soap. That brown octagon soap. Put it in hot water. They boiled wow. it on the stove. Let it get mushy. Made a paste. Mixed it up with sugar. Mm. And put it and put it and pasted my hands and tied my hands up to the old sheet. Woo. Tied my hands up and made a shell on it. And it kept from and it kept me from getting. I have a scar. But it's not, it didn't web up. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. these people, they have these burns and they have the big webs. And you could tell and it was a, a burn, right? People who get burned, they wear these socks on their head. Right. Now, she, what she did was take that brown soap and she put it on my hand. And Same it principle. put a shell on it. Damn. And I don't really, I don't have a web scar on me. I have a scar. But it's not a web scar. It's not webby or nothing like that. Now you see. So she does. My sister still follows what she does. My sister evil. The wheat Tina. The yeah. nasty wheat Tina. The nasty Farina. <laughs> I, um. Uh, <laughs> I eat. I eat terrible. I eat terrible. Yeah, we was talking about I, that before. It, it, that's, that's all right, because a lot of us eat terrible. We breathe terrible. You know what I'm saying? But the, <laughs> the no, air in, terrible, terrible. The air I in California, the, the air in California, Miss Beverly, can't be no bad, no worse than what you're eating. This shit oh. out here, when I look no, up I in eat, the, I eat, uh, I eat chitlins. <laughs> oh, oh my oh. lord, we got to, we got to get the chitlins. <laughs> But look, let me I say, love chitlins. Let me mention this before we go into the chitlins. Hold on. <laughs> I love, I love them, I love them, I love them. I eat them. I eat them. But no, I'm breaking away from it. I'm Man. breaking away from it now because I'm getting older and I'm, I realize <laughs> if I want to be here for a decent amount of time, that's right. I need to stop. But I do, I do my sister's. She don't eat nothing like that. She mm. even had my son talk about he because I eat pig feet too, and she Ooh, had my pig son. Feet. And he was little talk about he don't eat nobody's feet. I'm like, boy, he, he ain't never had no pig feet. You know what I used to do with pig lips? I I used to and see most people that grew up in the south they don't know nothing about this stuff. If you didn't grow up in the south or in the Midwest, you don't know what the hell we talking about. Pig feet, pig lips. Listen, they sell jars of pig lips and pig feet. We used to take the pig lips. Pig lips used to have a goddamn dirt on it from the pig sty and still have some stubble on the goddamn pig lip, y'all. Yes, Warfarin, pig lips, family. Watch this. 
We used to get the pig lip and buy vinegar and salt chips or plain chips, break the goddamn pig lip up in the chips and eat that shit. And that would be <laughs> it would be better than going out to, to Sizzler or the to or, or Olive hey. Garden. But it was terrible as far as health. Now let me let me go back one second. Let me go back one second, and then we get right into this chitlins again and, and pig lips. <laughs> but the the what the sister was pointing out again with those home remedies, y'all. Notice this: all of the home remedies that she talked about, all of it dealt with the same premise that Doctor Sebi and many of our great herbologists and teachers, health gurus, have taught. The premise. Of staying well is basically, I would say, two most prime things. Staying alkaline, which means drinking water, and and staying free from infection. And many of those home remedies, that's exactly what they attacked. The infection. It might have seemed like a harsh cure or a crazy idea, but Miss Beverly says she got burned. Skin came off, no infection, because the cure, the treatment, attacked the infection. Dr. Sebi said once you get all of that pus and infection and mucus out of your body, your body can fight damn near anything off. And that's the truth. And when you couple a body that's alkaline with a body that can fight off or with supplements fight off infection, then you got something good. And that's what our older generation was great at noticing common sense things that were actually the basis really of modern science, modern medicine. Infection, if you target it, you kill the cold. Now, the chitlins. <laughs> now, now, Miss Beverly says she's, you know, Okay, and like I said, if you look at the sky out here in California, this smog, this smog is like breathing um, a bag of dirt. Some places I go through in California, I could lick like my tick teeth, the enamel on my teeth is smooth normally. But when you're breathing in your mouth and you're going through a nasty area where there's a lot of pollution and dust and shit, it even get on your teeth, family. And I'm saying... We all have to try as much as possible. You know what I'm saying? The world we live in, the economy, the social constructs, it all makes damn near everything we do negative to a certain degree. You know what I'm saying? But there are things that you can do to offset certain things. You know, like if you're eating pork, you can try to cut back. You know what I'm saying? Pork and cheese and dairy products is just like cigarettes and heroin. It's hard to kick. It's hard to kick because we've been bred to eat that and we've learned to like that. I I don't I don't like chitlins, but if you put hot sauce on chitlins and you cover your nose, I, you I, I tell you you eat that just like you eat a steak. And I I know tripe cow tripe and these scavengers like coons. My daddy, man, I, I grew up in Detroit and then. In Louisiana, I got my later upbringing in the adolescence. My daddy, let me tell you another story. My dad, he grew up in the South, country boy, straight up country boy. A rock you to sleep, knock you out, shoot you, whatever. He moved and migrated to Detroit with my family, my mother and my brothers. And so I was born there in Detroit. My father in Detroit, I can remember taking trips to Louisiana. My father would run over an animal on accident, take the goddamn animal like a turtle, tie it to the back of the car, and drag the turtle to the turtle die, and then take the turtle, put the turtle in the trunk, in a bucket, and then take the turtle and bust that shell open and you eat turtle. My father used to have hogs in Detroit, the Motor City, Motown family, on the porch, 3292 Whitney. Close to Linwood and Dexter, the asshole part of Detroit, you hear me, where, they, where you find any and everything, the home of crack, right, not New York, Detroit. My dad would sit on the porch, Miss Beverly, and gut a hog 
Mm -hmm. He'd buy a hog from these rural places in Detroit and gut it and cook it and prepare it on the porch. I watched my father leave hog guts in the, on the porch for like two days sometimes. But then he'd have coon. Y'all, y'all, y'all talking about coon today. All these people talking about he, this nigga's a coon. He's a coon. These guys don't know nothing about no goddamn coon. My daddy, let me tell y'all something about a coon, then we're going to get back to Miss Beverly. Um, a coon has musk glands all throughout his body. That's the coon's defense, other than he'll, he'll scratch the fuck out of you and bite you. The coon sprays musk like a skunk. And to eat a coon, mind you, the coon is delicious. I mean succulent and juicy and great if you cook it right with seasoning and bay leaves and those things. But if you don't know how to cook a coon, you will poison yourself and you won't be able to sleep in your own house. If you leave one musk gland in a coon, that shit will get in your walls when you cook. It'll get in your clothes and your, your, your shears and blankets and everything. So my father learned how to get every musk gland from where the coons are. And I used to be so amazed watching him do that. And I'd be standing there because he knew I used to love to see him cut the foot off. He'll say, come here, monkey head. He got he used to call me monkey head. I come running. He said, get the foot. I grab the foot, pull it, he cut it off. <laughs> cut it off. Hack it off. And I take that goddamn foot, Miss Beverly, and run around all day scaring my friends and adults and everybody with a goddamn coon foot. <laughs> but my <laughs> Go ahead, that was just some of my my son saw one the man there was the lady there was using to babysit for me. He came upstairs and said, Oh, Mr. J B cooking the dog in the oven. <laughs> yeah, that's there. I see it. <laughs> he thought it they thought it was a dog. He said they cooking the dog in the oven and it was a cool. I didn't eat it. I was like, What? He said, Yeah. But um yeah, I see it all, but like, Ooh, like I said, when, after my grandmother died, I, you know, I started doing a lot. I was paying bills. I was doing laundry, you know, ironing and all stuff like that. And they, you know what? I think that's a lot of problem with the kids today. They got a lot of free time. Mm. They got a whole lot of free time. A whole my lot of free time. Knew, we couldn't even say we was bored because she said, she she said, Oh boy, here we here read the Bible so we <laughs> everybody find you something. We um we um actually we said she, if we said we was born, she said here, you ain't got nothing to do, read the Bible so naturally everybody go out and grab the book. Mm. That's how I've well I've been wow. and I've been reading, people don't believe this. I've been reading since I was four years old. What? Never had a babysitter. You reading books? Never had a babysitter. I've been since, you know, children's books, but I started reading at four. Mm -hmm. I went to school. When I went to kindergarten, I could I could read. I could mm -hmm. read somewhat when I went. Yes, my indeed. mother and my grandmother, they taught, they taught me how to do that. But growing up, I could, you could never say you were boy. My house was cluttered, cluttered with books. Wow. Books, I mean, all kinds of books and stuff. Straight information. And, yeah, and I love, that's how I love to read from my mother. I learned that from my mother. Wow. How, to, how to read because um, like I said I never had a I never had a babysitter I never went to daycare or nothing because my father always worked and he told my mother to stay home and take care of the kids mm. you know? so I and um, I would just read and like I said my grandmother she was old on old school Southern Baptist so wasn't no plan Miss Candy she, said she uh, loved this Miss Beverly Candy said she loved uh -huh. this Candy says she loving this. Uh, let me ask uh, you now, how how important, how important on a scale of one to ten, how important is reading to the development of young black men and women or even any young child, multiracial, reading. biracial, what on a scale of one to ten, how important is that? It's, it's like a 20 to me. It's <laughs> a 20 plus. Okay. See, but what people don't understand about reading is I was always taught that reading 
is more than knowing what a word. It's the comprehension that you have. Woo! I just said that the other day. Say that one more time, Miss Beverly. One more time with that. It's comprehension. Reading is more than um, reciting words. Mm. It's comprehension. Mm -hmm. It's it's what you comprehend. Because what my mother used to do, my mother would get the New York Times, which was, at that time, which was the thickest paper, I think, in the world. Yeah. That's what I used to eat to go get that paper. It was like 10 parts to it. I can imagine. She'd get it on a Sunday, and she'd read it. And the next Sunday, she'd be finishing, she'd read. So what she would do is she would read the paper, she'd keep it, and give, give me an article to read. Mm. And ask me, tell me to read it. And ask me, after I read it, she said, now, what did it say? Wow. Now, she already read it, so she knew what it was. And I had to sit there and read it and tell her, explain to her what it was. Explaining it, not and just not just doing not just doing a reading exercise, family, y'all. And this is important to teach the children reading comprehension, not just with the children, family, with the grown folks too in our community. Miss Beverly, I was teaching about that the other day, and I was telling the brothers and sisters, as gangster as I grew up, and crazy as I grew up, and wild as I grew up. Reading and school and scholastics was very important. My mom used to whoop the shit out of me about she actually scarred me about my multiplication tables. I I, I still hate multiplication today because mama, man, she wouldn't let me go to sleep. But reading, reading is so important to mental discipline. Miss Kent, Miss, damn, Candy, you better get your show on here. <laughs> but Miss Beverly is saying comprehension is the backbone of reading the skill and i'm saying to you definitely comprehension shapes the mind so that thought thought can bolster comprehension and create a child that can not only verbally express new thought but even thoughts of other people comprehension sparks thought not just regurgitated facts go ahead go on miss beverly Uh oh, you still there. okay? Look, look. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you another question. We coming up on an hour. This show is good. <laughs> this show is good. Um, here's another question. Now, in our cipher today, and I was talking about it earlier. My lady is a hairdresser. She's in the hair care industry. She's a licensed hairdresser and cosmetologist and all of that, right? But I talk to her a lot of times. About abusing people, man. Not abusing people, giving them bad hairstyles. Because she's great. She's one of the best, really. But the money and the abuse and the chemicals and all of that stuff. Now, I know we had conk back in the day. Malcolm and all these brothers used to do it. Some of these cats still conk their hair today. They don't call it conk. These niggas just going to texturizers and, and all that. But you can just call it conk. It's just lie. And different types of relaxers. I know what that is. Yeah, hydra. Who does it call it? Soldier. Soldier. Uh, so, some type of. Double, it, I can't think of the acid. It, it's, called, it's called texturizing, and it's funny that you're talking about that because remember I told you I said I'll go on here, but I don't want nobody to see me because I'm transitioning my hair <laughs> yeah. from from like twenty, thirty years of. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. my head looks a mess. No, nah, well, I don't know if I'm gonna cut it. I don't know. And I got some texturizer. And I open the box. I'm gonna put it in. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, God, do I want to do this? Mm. Do I want to put it back? I'm trying. So Here I'm trying a, not to. But and that's a good example. You've been a good had example. It in my hair because my hair is curly. It's thick and curly. Yeah, I've seen a couple pictures of you and your hair. It is I, it look like it's naturally like that? It don't look like it's processed. Processed. I thought that was just the you know your hair. Uh, no, my hair, my hair is 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 loose. It's, I, <laughs> I didn't realize how thick it was because when you put the perm in your hair, the perm thins your hair down. Yes, it do. It like thins your hair. Yes, so it do. So by all of it being out of my head now, I'm like, oh boy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see 
Sodium hydroxide. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Sodium yeah. hydroxide. I ain't even looking at the chat. Sodium hydroxide. Thank you, Warren. Creamy crack. Yeah, That's what it. <laughs> they call it they creamy call crack. It creamy crack. That's right. Straight they up call it Creamy crack. And you know it's, what? It damages your hair. It does. It damages your hair itself, the roots, the follicles, and even what's under the follicles, your brain. I I even look. I I. <laughs> and I shout out to Tazariak. I'm an Israelite. I love Tazaria. That's my brother. And I love to, you know, give him the business every now and then. I just poke at him to get him to, you know, tweak a couple things about what he do. I told Tazaria one time, I said, boy, what do you got in your beard? Just for me? A uh, goddamn. He's the only Israelite I know with totally straight beard. And this brother here beard in the summertime. It'd be like you had to turn your head like this because it'd be glistening with juices and berries and whatnot and shining and shit. I told him, I said, brother, what did you got in your hair? Te texturizer? Now, you know, Deuteronomy, and I mean, the, the Bible says for Israelites, not just in the law. Don't put that razor on your face. But come on. Lie and sodium hydroxide in your beard? Now, that's too close for comfort. But some of the brothers today do that. And it's dangerous. It is not only damaging, like Ms. Beverly saying, it's damaging the hair itself, but it definitely damages the follicles and what's inside your skin, which is organs and tissues and things that you're going to need. I saw. I've an, actually had my scalp to bleed. Ooh, bleed I've to had, bleed? I've had my scalp. My mother told Lord me not to do it, but I went on and did it anyway. Yeah, I, I remember my brother mixed up a ravine perm. Uh, uh, what was it? Ravine. And there was a, well, I forget the name of it, but it was two different types of perm. He didn't have enough because he used to like to conk his hair. <laughs> we was in the, like the 90s, early 90s. He mixed two goddamn perms, Miss Beverly. Man, if I'm lying, I'm dying. My brother put this shit on his hair. And, you know, when you're, when you're black, you got to leave that on there. Right up until it's damn near too late. You know what I'm saying? You be like, ooh, ooh, wait, uh, wait, wait, just a few minutes. And ah, get it, get it, get it, wash it off. My brother messed around there and mixed two perms, ravine and something else. It probably was lithium hydroxide or goddamn. <laughs> he washed his hair down the sink. I've seen it done before. Miss Beverly, watch My this. My watch that hair off. He had literal smoke coming from his head. He was jumping up, <coughs> jumping up and down, screaming, running through the house because I think my stepfather was outside cutting the grass and dealing with stuff out in the yard. So he would literally cut off the water and the gas. So why he out there on the riding lawnmower. My brother didn't know that. This fool went in there and put all that shit in his hair come out screaming with his head I remember Miss Beverly it was white like a little you ever seen it, a football player in the cold they take off the helmet and you can see all of the, the condensation I mean the steam from the hot head and the cold air hitting right. it was just like that he burned I that stuff is crazy. he almost burned a hole in his head Miss Beverly this boy my brother yeah, <laughs> it, it, it does like it does that I've had I've had um I've had doors in my head from it, scabs in my head from it. Ooh, wee. And, um, I'm just, I, I, I don't know. But I got to do something with my head. So I you're doing do the right thing right now. Get, you're doing the right thing. You're making steps and you're making steps towards things. And that's what I brought up. You're making steps towards things. And that's what I You're doing the right thing. You're making steps towards things. And that's what I brought you on the show to show not just the young women, but the older women. Come on, man. You don't have to be, you know, super conscious. Super RBG sister, you know, super, super empowerment. We all real. We humans. We go through things. We have to adjust and adapt with situations and our money. But when you can say, even as an older, wise, seasoned sister, that you know what? Even today, I'm making changes, whether they're subtle or great. That's a great example, Ms. Beverly. And I'm telling you. You saying that, being transparent about that, is going to help somebody not to get their scalp burned off. You're going to help somebody to leave that pork alone or even make steps towards it. And you're definitely going to help 
some of these young men and women learn that reading and comprehension is important and definitely oh, yeah. uh -huh, and definitely honoring what our elders have taught us in the way of health and even the extreme home remedies and shit those things this is this is gold this is like sitting at the foot of any elder that's great called a guru okay because what you get when you talk to the elders and the wise sisters is you get aha moments. That moment of epiphany that says, you know what? Damn, this is real. Life is real. And one day, I'm going to be where Miss Beverly's at. If you're 35 right now, one day you're going to be where she's at. And if you don't make it there through your health, then it's nobody's fault but yours. But you can make it and you can make steps just like this sister is still making steps and more. Now, now, Miss Beverly, I want you to give us one more good. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me, let me, let me not cut you off at go all. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Okay. I want you to give us one more good a shot at your upbringing in the sense that I'm, I'm going to ask you this question and I want you to go into this one again too. All right. Because that's very important to me. Like, when I meet people, I like to know who they are, you know, what what made them, what shaped them, what brought us. Miss Candy says, yes, that's why my closest friends are 10 plus years older than me. I learned a lot from them. Real talk. The older sisters can help the younger sisters, but it's up to the younger sisters to kind of uh, uh, humble yourselves so that you can see the truth and the reason why these sisters got to where they are. Mm -hmm. And even the brothers. But here's the question. Here's a question. <laughs> it's warfare still in there putting that lithium hydroxide. They got lithium hydroxide now. Not just sodium. Damn. I thought they was just. I was looking at the toothpaste ingredients. They got fluoride. And now they got. Uh, fluoride ion, as if that makes it better. These people trying to kill us for sure through eugenics and all this stuff. But again, here it is. When you see today's generation, what is the greatest point of wisdom that you can give to not just the young women, but to the young brothers? What do you see as the greatest negative in the lives of young people, not just black people, but young people today, and what can they do to avoid some of those pitfalls? What do you see as the, the, the main threats, and what can they do to avoid some of the pitfalls? Because you avoided many of them, and I want you to tell them what some of those things are and what, how, they could, how, they could, how they could avoid them. You know what, you know what the biggest thing for me Mm -hmm. The biggest thing for me, I'm going to tell you, now I was no, I'm going to say I was no angel, but I had an older sister mm -hmm. who, who couldn't come home on time. And I remember my mother get, being at the door, she's mm -hmm. supposed to be home 12 o'clock, mm -hmm. come home too, but I remember my mother came to the door, she came to the door and my mother what my mother did was, when you went out, you had to turn in all your keys. Wow. And you had to knock on that door. You couldn't come through the back door. You had to come, come, come in there and knock on the door. And I had an older sister, so I pretty much knew what I could get away with, what I couldn't get. Mm. My mother would get up and come and get you. Wow. It wasn't no waiting until you come home. No. No, she didn't do that. And what I see with these kids today, these kids today... They, they, they ain't got no fear. Mm -hmm. See, people say I don't want, I don't want my kids to fear me. Fear is good. That's I had right. A, I had a fear of my mother. Mm. My mother was no joke. She was no joke. My dad worked all the time, and we were girls. And he used to say, to "My mother, a man with Louise." He said, "You take the care of them because." I'm a man, I might hurt them. If they was boys, I'd handle them. Mm. But they girls, you know, they're going to get married, they're going to want to have kids. He said, I heard them. I work and you take care of the kids. My mother would come and get you. These kids today don't have it. They don't have no kind of, I don't wow. know, I don't know what's wrong with them. Because mm. um, Hassan did a, um, a video, I don't know if you saw it, about a girl 
on World Star Hip Hop. Talk about she was having an abortion and was twerking in the abortion office and somebody was... Um, sick. That's sick. Some, somebody was recording it. But come to find out, the girl is a comedian. Because mm. if you go on Instagram, I forgot her name, but if She's you go comedian? on Instagram, you'll see it. She's a comedian. Supposedly a comedian. See, yeah. when, I grew, when I grew up, my mother, well, my grandmother, first of all, I had grandmother. People tell me mm. that I act old. Well, I was raised by old people. They tell me that too. You know, I was raised by old people. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, because my mother, um, my mother, my mother couldn't have, couldn't have a lot of kids. Actually, I was supposed to be a tumor. They told my mother she could never, she had my, she was, she got married young, but she didn't, it took her a while to have my sister. Then there was space between me. I was actually a tumor. They told my mother she needed, that's another thing. That's a whole nother issue. They told your mother that you were a tumor? She needed a complete hysterectomy. And she, she didn't take the word of the doctor. She went and got a second opinion. And the second opinion told her, I don't know who told you that, but you're pregnant. It was with me. Wow. So after she had me, she took me back to the doctor that told her she needed a complete hysterectomy and see that this is my tumor. Wow. This is the tumor. I was eight pounds, 15 and a half ounces. Natural childbirth, my mother has. So, but wow. see, what I'm saying, I'm saying that to say this. You have to have two parents and you have, your kids have to have a fear. Fear is healthy. Mm. Fear, and when I say fear, I don't mean fear with like they so scared, like you go, like these girls today are bashing these kids and killing them. Uh-huh. Not that kind of fear, but I knew that I could not stay out late. I could stay out late, but I knew my mother was coming to get me. Like I said, I had an older sister that did not know how to come home on time. Mm. My mother would come and get you. Yes, I, indeed. I never forget. When she she would come get you that night, not wait until people come tell you. And she hey, come and get you. Mm. When I turned 18 on my 18th birthday, I mm. never forget. I was washing the dishes and I asked her, could I, go, could I go out? And she said no. I told her, I, she was in the bedroom because we had a bedroom off from the kitchen. And she said, no, don't leave the house. So I told her, I'm 18. I, can, I don't know why I can't go. I dried my hands, I washed the dishes, dried my hands, and I went out. I met up with my girlfriends, with my friends. And they went somewhere else, and they asked me to go, and something told me, don't go. I stayed where I said I was going to go. Mm. And I never forget, and we were dancing. It was, it was a little teenage club and stuff. My mother came, she caught a cab, she came, she came with a big old switch, braided together switch <laughs> for the bushes. Came and snatched me off the dance floor. Mm. Hit me right there. Never forget it. I, I can still see it now. <laughs> Caught a cab. And it was so bad. I was so embarrassed. Caught a cab. As she got out the cab, the man asked for the money. She said, Oh, I ain't got no money. I'll pay you when my I'll pay you I'll pay you when my husband gets paid. She was about that business trying a, to get her baby. <laughs> yeah. She mm. came she got me. She paid him. And, but it had the guy that was the guy that picked us up that she got that came to God and he was a friend. We knew him, so he put the money in and he paid. But kids don't have fear. Wow. They don't have a fear of anything. So I had to sit about me knowing that my mother would come and get me, by her coming to get me, a lot of stuff that I would have done. Mm. Now, I ain't going to tell you no lie. I was hell once I got into hell. <laughs> but I didn't like being embarrassed. Yeah. I come home at 11, I'd be there. And when my mother said 11 o'clock, she did not mean 1101, mm. not mean 1105. Upstairs in her house, mm. when that clock hit 11, you better be in that house and be in her house. All yeah. for love's and sake. People don't do that no more. Mm-hmm. All for love's sake because she loved her children. And now you look look at this generation at the re- reoccurring thing. And I don't want to bring the sister's name up for nothing. But 
I have to do it because of what we're talking about. Uh, rest in peace to the dear sister Kanika Jenkins and even her family and her mother. But the truth is, what the sister Beverly here is saying is mothers, her mother, and these people here back in these days, not only warfare and said curfew, they was dead serious about you honoring their word. And when they say you be where you're supposed to be, where you told me you was going to be, and when you're supposed to be back here, be back here, or all hell is going to break loose. And it's going to start with me finding you and finding where you at. And then you might get embarrassed. Miss Beverly said with a switch. And these kids don't even know what a damn, damn switch is. But let me define a switch for you again because I grew up in the South. A switch is when you walk outside, and in the South, they got special bushes that make great switches. Switches, Bushes where you can grab the, the, the limb, pull the limb, snap it, and then grab the top of it and just pull all the leaves off. And it's straight up bendable and will work all day. Yep. They would take them switches and braid them. Miss Beverly said braided switches. Uh, I know. They tie them at the end. Take three times, braid them up, tie them at the top, and top, braid them up, and then tie them at the bottom. Mm. Tear your behind up with them. And I got hit with the electric cord. Now that. That, yeah. that hurts. My, my mama used man, to. man, that extension cord. Because I saw talk about that extension cord. Mm -hmm. and, whew, or them old I plastic bottom slippers. Them old cheap $2 no. plastic, them, them old $2 cheap plastic bottom slippers that grandmothers used to slide their feet in and they, they be popping the back of their feet. <laughs> my mother used to yeah. take them goddamn slippers and go upside my head. And because it wouldn't leave a bruise, she could really get busy. But all of this that we're talking about is today considered abuse. But look but you, at our generation. That was love. Because but I you know what I did? Mm -hmm, go ahead. You know what I did, did one time? I, like I said, I was no angel. I don't pretend no, to be me no neither. angel. Yes, right. <laughs> I, was, I was no angel. And my mouth... My mouth got me in so much trouble. I remember mm. I was, I was, um, I don't know what happened. My father said something good to me. And my, my father was the type, type of person, he would talk to you. He would talk. Now, my mother was that one that would get you. And i never forget, he said something to me. And I said, oh, sit down, shut up, and be quiet. And the next thing I knew, we had like a little hallway, like a little pad, a little hallway between the kitchen and the dining room and my bedroom and stuff. And I remember he palmed my head like a basketball <laughs> upside the wall. i never forget it. And I couldn't get away from it. But then he flipped me. I got in the room. I tried to lock the door so he couldn't come in, but he put busted the door open. Mm. He flipped me over the uh, footboard on the bed. And to this day, I do not have a footboard on my bed. <laughs> he put the pillow over my head. He tried to kill me. You don't want he that footboard on you? He tried to kill me. He tried to kill me. I will never forget that. <laughs> then, I don't know what else happened. I called Ooh. the cops. And, whoa. <laughs> I was like, I was, my mouth did. He something I wanted to do, and and he wouldn't let me do it. And I called the cops. I never forget this. Ooh, and he was taking tearing me up with that belt, and mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden you hear this loud bang on the door. Patterson the police. He stopped hitting me. He opened the door. He said yes. And they they said what's going on in here. His exact words was. I'm beating my daughter's ass. Do you mind? Turn around and tore me up again. Like <laughs> he told him, my, do you mind? My, my dad was not, my, now my dad wouldn't Damn. hit you. My dad wouldn't hit you. And my mother, after, <laughs> after it was all over, my mother said, to, my mother, and I didn't come from, my mother knew they didn't curse not like that, but my mother, she was like, what the hell was, what was you thinking of when you said all of this? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. And my sister, my sister, she was terrible. When my father was 
smothering me with this pillow. She was like, get her, daddy, get her, get her. <laughs> she got a bit now. She wouldn't let my mother get up. And my mother had those nylon stockings on. And we had Lenoe in the living room. And she was pushing her back. So I don't want nobody to think I was an angel. But uh, <laughs> I was a mess. <laughs> but um, yeah. so the thing was... Get with me. Yeah, I called the cops on him. And my, my, you called my, him. My, oh, God. My father went off on me. Mm. And my mother was, after it was all over, my mother called me in the room. She called me in the room and she was like, what the hell was wrong with you? Now you so, Why you know would you some, do that? You know something? Some of those old people and our parents, my parents, the same, same way. My father used to it, the issue all the whoopings, the real whooping. My mother would issue the whoopings that would make you cry. But my daddy would give the whoopings that would make you say, you know what? He done whooped Junior ass. I'm good. I'm not going to do that shit ever. My daddy, I remember this one time, my father, we was living in Michigan, right? And y'all know it snows bad in Michigan, all up north. My, my brother, this, he used to do this shit all winter long. Instead of him, my daddy would tell him, Junior, go get the garbage. Take it outside to the alley, to the dumpster. My brother with his slick, smooth ass, he would take the garbage for months while it's snowing. He would take it right to the back door and sling the bags. The trash go up in the air, the, just trickle, rain down trash, right? The next morning, you couldn't even tell there was no trash out there. Snow covered it up. But when the summer came, and all of that shit started melting. My daddy would come home. And I remember this happened two summers. My brother got beat damn near. I think my dad beat my brother probably for an hour straight. Like literally 60 minutes. Like the longest whooping you will ever hear. Beat that boy until he changed his perception on life. And my my perception <laughs> my perception changed too because I started saying, you know what? At that point, my daddy whooped him so bad till it was obvious that yeah, you know what? Even as a kid, you know what? You shouldn't have done that, man. You could have just took the trash to the dumpster and look at all this trash. But me saying that is to say this: my father, your your parents, your guardians, your your grandmother, and all of those people that cared for you and brought you up. They didn't have fear. Why? Because of love. And they didn't cower away from social services and the police and all this. And they would even tell you, you call the goddamn police while I'm loving you, whooping your ass and teaching you these hard lessons. I'm going to whoop your ass harder till they get there. And I might even whoop on one of these motherfucking police. That's how my daddy was. And those things taught me not only respect for him. But it allowed me to keep them things in the back of my mind. So when, I, when I'm when i looking at my children today, and I'm saying, you know what? Damn, I don't want to whoop them. I don't want to whoop them. I say, you know what? Let me not spare the rod. Let me not spoil the child. Because if you don't, in certain situations, the children have no scope of fear, reverence. And I'm not talking about trembling fear of your fathers and mothers. But a reverent fear that, you know, obviously you treat your mother and father just like you treat your gods. And this is what the, the Torah lays out as the way to honor God, to honor your mother and father that your days be long upon the land. And it says also to not spare that rod. If you do, you spoil the child. And truly, 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 there's a lot of kids, a lot of young adults today in the grave because their parents didn't love them. Their parents were afraid of the police, afraid of CPS and social services, just afraid of everything. And that equates into a lack of love. And we ought to be seeing this in the modern generation. We, You hardly ever see a child get a whooping today. If you see it, it's going to be in the house, back in the back room, and nobody going to do But back in the day... Man, the next door neighbor could whoop you, could tell your mama, look, I seen this nigga down the street jacking off in the bushes, and your mother wouldn't say, don't be telling me that about my son. They go ask the child first, 
in the presence of the person that reported and brought him and get disciplined. You get disciplined from everybody in the village. These are the simple things, but the real things that make communities successful and keeps children alive. Our sister Kanika Jenkins met her final fate because not only, like Miss Beverly said, those kids ain't have no damn fear. They was out somewhere where they shouldn't have been in an unsafe environment doing unsafe things. And we all do that. But straight up, it was different. Do you from know, so, uh -huh, go did ahead. you know that when I was her age at 19, I'll never forget. My mother had this thing mm. where okay, when I got like a lot of my friends, I, well, I was older than some of them, but I, um, I never forget the first night. The first time I went, I went over to New York. I had went to the high school, and um, I went over to New York. And my mother's thing was, "Don't let the sun come up before you come in." Mm. Yes, Meaning, indeed. I had to get in the house before the sun before the sun come. You know, and that's go very out, important. Do what you gotta do, but don't don't stay out of my house all night long. Mm -hmm. And I went into a club in New York. And when I came out, it was dark when I went out, and the sun was bright, shining bright. Now, I was the oldest one, mm -hmm. and I was scared to come home. Mm. That was my first night ever staying out there. <laughs> I was literally scared to go in my house. Yes, indeed. I'm like, Lord, I done stayed out all night. What am I going to do? And that's the that's a I positive just, thing. That's a, that's a reverent fear that kept you with boundaries. Kept you even to say, you know what, even if I stay out too late, I better not go home smelling like that shit. Go home smelling like liquor or, or weed or whatever. It yep. kept boundaries around your mind and about your body and your your, your cipher. So, then, yep. that, that, that's this this stuff here, I want to have a part two to this conversation, Miss Beverly. What, what you say about that? Can say that have, again? Can we have a part two to this here, to this show? We could if you want to, when you want to do it. Uh, let's do it this week sometime. What, whatever day, maybe. We let's could see. do a part two. But before you win this one, I do want to say something. Oh, no, go ahead. Because you, I, I said uh, you could end this one up. But, you know, before before you came on here, you need to get on your, um, get on that fool, Israel doctor. <laughs> I want to shake him. I literally <laughs> want to shake him. Speak. I want Woo. to. Sh I want to shake him. No. I just want to. This man. Now, how I met, how I found out about her son. I'm gonna say this, and we can end it on this. How I found out about her son. I saw the article about African Bambada. Uh -huh. Now, I never liked uh, African Bambada and uh, his music. I, I seen him. It was just something about. I never met him or nothing. Creep. Just seen him on TV. A uh, creep. Just stuff about this man, I didn't... He didn't move me. <laughs> he, he, he just didn't move me. I didn't like him. So when I saw it, you know, he was on Lisa Lisa Evans. That's, um, that's a news station, Channel uh -huh. 5 Fox News station. Oh, and uh, she does a thing called Street Soldiers. Yes, and he I was mean. saying, oh, I never did anything. So I started checking on it. Mm. So that's it. So then I started reading up on what he was accused of, and then that's how I found Ron Savage and his son's name. Wow. And I was listening to it, and and you know, and I heard what her son had to say. Uh -huh. I heard what he said about you know he was molested by them. And one thing I do know, one thing about men I do know for sure. No man will, he may lie, men lie. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say they don't lie. Oh, yes. But one thing a man will never do is will never lie and tell you that he was touched by another man. A say man it. will never say tell that you that. Shit. Never, ever will they tell you that. Real talk. There's something about that that a man will not let you know. You can see it happen and then it won't happen. Talk. You know, it didn't happen. But Israel doctrine, mm. what is wrong with him? <laughs> I, I wanted, oh God, I wanted him to come in here so bad. He done lost his mind. I can't take him. What he, is wrong with that man? I think he, done he, did a, he, took another, he done did another thing. And he talking the same, he, he sounds demonic. Say it again, Miss Beverly. Yeah, he sounds demonic. That's what you say? 
Yeah. He sounds demonic. Yes. And he done went in there and pour candy. He done ripped candy all over the place. And I'm just that old. Let you, me say, my, I know we talk about me. That old dried up talking ass woman. <laughs> Disrespectful you, old stupid ass fool. You know that Lord, devil? I said I wasn't going to cuss. Oh, man. That cussing is natural. That's a natural flow of words. That's that's uncensored over here. I am so sorry. I said I wasn't going to do that. Mm -mm, now, mm -mm, I got a potty go mouth, and I got to stop, because nah. I got granddaughters, and I'm trying to teach my granddaughters the right way. I bet but you they can hear the, the, the real in that, behind the cussing. Huh? They'll hear the real behind the cussing in that. They ain't, go ahead. <laughs> I, um, you know... I just don't understand, I don't understand people. Mm. It's because I don't believe what they said because I don't follow them. Wow, I've, I've never been a follower. That's how I've made it through so far. I've always thought for, for, for myself. Candy, I've Candy said that. Y'all was talking about y'all today. Huh? Candy said the devil was, this devilish nigga was talking about y'all today. Yeah. That's a wicked yeah. nigga, man. He was talking about on his live today. He just can't. He just he just can't get it. He just can't. He cannot stop. But my thing of it is with people. I don't understand people, and that's another thing about me. I will give you the shirt off my back mm. if I am your friend. I'm your friend. Mm. I'm to the end. I'm that ride or die, but I'm not so ride or die that I'm not going to get myself in a world of trouble following behind you either. Right, right. But, um, but, but I, I'm, I don't follow the crowd because, because you don't like, because you don't like them. I can't like them. Yeah, you know. That kind of mentality. I hate I that. I don't follow that stuff. I hate that. And that's exactly what that boy doing. He's trying to control the minds of people through telling you. What he think about this brother, his homosexual thoughts. And remember, me and brother Sarnetta was talking about this today. Me, Hassan, and Sarnetta was talking about it because we was on a conference call. We was talking about what is so strange about this Negro. More so, than Ms. Beverly just pointed that out. He's just a weirdo and a disrespectful Negro and disrespectful to women just totally. But watch this, Ms. Beverly. As long as I've been knowing Israel Doctrine as an entity, I've never seen this Negro with one woman in his presence, in his house. He don't talk about no women other than maybe his sister. He don't talk about no woman. I heard him one time, I, let me correct, one time, he said that he had sex with a white woman. Now that's neither here nor there, but... Why in the world won't he just get a woman? Candy says, just dogs in there. And he, he's probably so low. Uh, bestiality, I'm telling you, this nigga here done reached the bottom of the pit. And I wouldn't put it past the Negro that'll sit up in his mother's investment. His mother passed away, bless her soul. Left this nigga a whole house. He got dogs shitting in there. Won't honor his mama to bring and father to bring forth some seed from his wretched balls and plant some seed and have children with a woman, much less have a relationship. And, and this is the terrible nigga that sits up there and degrades women. But this is nothing new for him. He did this shit like two years ago to Sister Renee, called this woman a bitch on the air over and over and over and over and over. Then I got people to blacklist him about it. And he was proud of it. He was proud of it, y'all. Yeah, that's what he did today. That's what he called Candy. I think he called Candy a bitch. He called me some kind of stupid mess. And I'm like, no, this fool ain't sitting up here. That nigga he need to ask about, It's my house. It's my dog shit in the house. He can do what he want to do. I let him do what he want to do. Ha, 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 ha. I'm mm, like, this mm, man mm. is fool. And the people that listen to him is more fool than he is. And them people that if they will follow a nigga that got dog shitting in the house... I'm not talking about accidents. You got a dog in the house. I'm talking about this nigga, Leron. Leron G. Consciousness. Leron G. Consciousness told us this boy lets them dogs shit 
and piss in the house. Now, you hear that? That's another mother there, getting them together. <laughs> Y'all hear that? That's what I'm talking about. Mothers getting them together, you hear me? But Leron told us this nigga here disrespects his mother and father's investment in him to leave this nigga a house. This clown ass nigga won't clean the front, back, his body, the rooms, nothing. Won't even clean the dog hair and the dog shit and piss out the house. He said he would clean his sister's house either. That's a shame. <laughs> Lord have he mercy. Said he would do it. I said, this man is crazy. It's just, <laughs> it, it's just, you know. And then, then you got Petey. Petey. Uh, 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 oh, I just want to get hold of her. Petey. I just want to get hold of her because I, I just got something I want to say to her because she sat up there and talked. She talked all kind of stuff to me, but because I was the one who caught her. I, I was the one I listened to. And I saw her name there. She was talking about her son. And I'm like, wait a minute. This girl is in the group. And how are you going to be in there? And then you're going to talk about the man. Mm. I've never seen people like this in my I've life. Seen for I've not seen these woman? kind of black people. Where do they come from? Listen, listen to this, Miss Bell. Where do they come from? She, Petey, and we got to tell y'all who Petey is. Petey. PD number one is the dog from the Little Rascals with the one ring around his eyes. We gave Thawana Allen, a.k.a. Lack of Black, that name because she loves, I mean, them bags around her eyes. Her and Sarah Sutonsetti, they could probably set up a game uh, tent at a fair and clean up with all the rings they dealing with, family. I mean, these Negroes got rings and bags under their eyes from no sleep in months. But that's the only woman that rides with them devilish Negroes like Israel Doctrine and a few trolls that he got. What business do a real woman got sitting up there allowing this nigga to defame other women that have not aggressed this bitch ass nigga? Excuse me, y'all. But have not aggressed him. And then this same woman won't even tell that trifling ass nigga. That you held that child pornography video way too long, dog, for you to be honored as a real man. We call you a child pedophile and a porn, a child porn connoisseur because Hassan showed us and the ignorant that don't know how. And Israel claimed to be ignorant, but yet he could sit his stinking ass on YouTube for 10 years doing the same fucking thing. 10 years. Hassan... Showed the brother how to get rid of it and report it and do all of the stuff, necessary thing. Israel holds the motherfucking video, the child porn video, until the police, the sheriff, show up at his junky ass he goddamn house. He has downloaded house. on his hard drive, downloaded. on his computer, on his main computer. And that's exactly why he's so mad when I talked about it. And and we we all was we was dealing with all them streams and stuff, and y'all was commenting in the chat, and everybody talking about it. He mad that he we talked to about. It. He said he does. Yes, he mad I don't because nothing. he mad because I know that he not only got the cell phone that he just got, but the laptop that an older lady helped him get to harass people. She didn't even know that's what this nigga do. Beg the lady for this kind of donation. He buys that laptop and sits in men's laps all fucking day. But then the niggas got a external hard drive that he only brings out. When his back is against the wall, like when me and Sinetta pressed him last year and got him real bad, then he'll bring it out and he'll show this external hard drive. He been had that hard drive for about four or five years that I know. And I'm telling you, I know for a fact that the contents of that porn video is either on that hard drive and the laptop and the phone. But he gave the phone to the police. He didn't tell the police about the motherfucking the hard drive that he got everybody in the community on. And then he slipped, Miss Beverly. He slipped and said, I, I don't want the police looking at my computers and my hard drive. And I'm saying, nigga, if you're accused of child pornography, why in the fuck are you scared to let them look in your shit? If there ain't no child porn in there, nigga, we know what you are, Izzy. And the police know, too. 
They probably still looking up your ass with a fine magnifying glass, probably times a million. Looking up in your shit, checking you, bro, because you're questionable. Everything you say now is questionable. I love to use that sound bite from it. <laughs> but Miss Candy, Miss Beverly, I'm going to let you have the last, I'm going to let you take the last statement. Cause I see the lights popping on in the house. Yeah. I mean, that means the lady that came in. <laughs> so I got Well, the only thing I'm going to say, we could do a part two of Let's it. Let's do you know, part and then we're gonna two. And we're going to get back to the more, more, serious, more serious things. And, you know, yeah. talk about more serious things. Um, we're going to pick up right um, from where we like, left off here. Cause we, I got a good chance to get to know you tonight. What happened? I, didn't hear you. I got a good chance to get to know you tonight, and that's that's really what I really wanted to have this conversation, so that I and the people could get to know you, and so that they can trust listening to you. And you, you got a beautiful spirit, you're a beautiful sister, wise sister, and I'm telling you, I want to pick up from where we left off on Izzy, so we could really go in on him. And I'm let let, let you. You know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm on I mean, back. you know, this, I, I, like I said, I don't understand people at all hmm. I, I just don't understand that I'm not used to that I'm not used to these kind of people that's mm -hmm. vicious that's cool that's, that's you just don't if you don't like people I always leave them alone anybody I don't like uh -huh. I leave alone right. I just walk away I let you do what you gotta do and I judge people if I'm if I'm in a room and we're talking and people are talking and I see that you're friends with somebody, but then you, I listen to your conversation. Mm -hmm. And if your conversation, if you're talking about the person that you're supposed to be friends with, mm -hmm. that's for me to back off. Yes, that indeed. That's for me to back off. I don't make any comments. I don't do anything. I just did. I, people tell me I'm standoffish. I'm not standoffish. I just. You're real. I, I, I just don't <laughs> like mess. I don't like a lot of mess. I hate messy people. Mm -hmm. I call it being messy. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I just don't like people. I don't like people who kick people when they're down. I don't kick anybody when they're down. I don't, um, I don't argue with people. I don't, but I've never been a bully. I've never been one to fight, fight, you know. And a lot of times, you know, I see a lot of comments they make. And, uh, a lot of times when I, when his eyes goes on his rant, like rant on his rant, I understand where he's coming from because I'm the Me same too. way. Me too. I uh, take it. I take for so much. How much can one person take? Okay. How can they two hundred videos on one darn man? Two hundred goddamn is videos. Not right. I counted them. And I'm going to end it on that. Hmm. Ms. Some Beverly, ain't right. Some that, ain't right with her. And some ain't right with YouTube either. That lets that shit happen. <laughs> 200 goddamn videos on one person from one fucking channel. That's a goddamn shame. But that lets you know what kind of cypher we out here in, in this entertainment industry and the entertainment world. Man, they love blood sports. These motherfuckers will let black people destroy each other for a few nickels and pennies. You know what I'm saying? But then let you get to talking about the real shit. Like they took my one of my channels down. Me talking about James Yeager. Why well, I can't talk about James Yeager? But they'll let me uh, 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 just destroy. Is he that white pastor? No, James Yeager is a gun nut. He's a he's an ex uh, military, not military guy, because he was like a, a private security dude and went overseas and left his damn troop to get shot the fuck up and he hiding under dead bodies and shit using motherfuckers for shields but this white man is prejudiced and he he had a video out talking about mexicans and dogging and mexicans and shit out and I, I reported this motherfucker and i got his channel banned off the internet and boy the white people went crazy on me they got me blacklisted on facebook they got my main channel took off YouTube, my last one. And that's why on RBG Hebrew 2, there's only 500 subscribers because it's fairly new. I was using another channel. And then white people hit me like that. But I'm saying they let Israel Doctrine do, I mean, this shit that day. could cause a, a person to kill themselves. 
200 motherfucking videos, family, on one man. YouTube allows that shit. Won't even take this nigga off all the way. We get his shit all wrecked up and shit. And I'm saying, damn, when is this nigga going to go off the air? Totally. When are they going to ban him like they banned James? Well, he Reagan? was scared for a while. For, for. <laughs> he was. <laughs> he got flagged. I think they're flagging him. I think they're going to get rid of him. But it's slow because they're hiring more people. You know Israel is messing it. with... You know Israel messing with them people and all that stuff. We we was all telling with that you was in and hearing all that and talking and talking about it. Israel messing with them people. And we, I ain't gonna ruin the next show. But I'm telling you, y'all, when we when me and Miss Beverly go in on this next show, and we want Miss Candy in in the house. Yes, yes, yes. And we even you know, after that we let you have your own show and you can blaze this Negro back the the way he need to be blazed. <laughs> for saying that disrespectful foul fool ass shit when he should have been saying you know what sister I ain't had a real woman in my life in years can I call you later on and maybe you can uh maybe even soothe my 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 feathers down or yeah, help me find a woman or get a date shit this nigga here want that no nobody oh, wants that nigga nasty bastard nobody want him Smell like shit and everything. Leron said, "This boy here, Miss Miss Beverly. I'm gonna say this one. I'm gonna let him go. I'm look. Leron said he picked Israel Doctrine up to take him to Tennessee. It was a debate, right? He said this nigga got in his in his vehicle, and Izzy had the goddamn vehicle so lit up to Leron had to literally tell him, bruh." We're going to Tennessee from Arkansas. How you going to leave the state and you smell like that? And this nigga got in somebody's car like that, family. And I, I guess he, you know, he even got immune to the smell. He didn't even know it. Got in a goddamn another person car smelling like a goddamn coyote. Uh, smelling like a motherfucking timber wolf. But I tell you what, family. Miss Beverly, can you give your tw uh, your Instagram out so the people can find and follow you um i got quite a few of them oh you got a lot I of them with, well which was i used uh beverly six seven uh six eight six seven i think that's it beverly six seven six eight i think that's it yeah y'all follow miss beverly uh, there? And, and I got I got an Israel doctor an Israel doctor and stalker too because I don't know if you see <laughs> see my it's, it's my Instagram stuff but with my son with my son you got a stalker too I don't, you know because um, I don't he because I got one that sits there everything I say wow. they come back and they they sit and they sit up there and tell my son all this stuff because my son is in the music thing he's in the music, ah. in the music stuff and uh tell, tell, if, you, if you got your twist up the words I'm like damn here they go twist up the words everything I say they they make it sound like for themselves I said damn even the, even the young kids are stupid man when so you come back a, on when you come back on, I want you to bring some of the some of the information where we could find you. We could find the brother and check out some of his stuff, cause that's what we about. We about networking and anything. Well, that, it's his. Well, my well, my son. You talking about my son, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, my son. Um, he has an independent uh, website. Well, he has an independent record label. Wow, nice. An independent record label. Nice. So we started it with his friends and stuff. Yes, um, I can tell you that now. Tell it to tell, tell it to it us. Is. Say it, please. It's, uh, RGF Productions. Say it one more time. RGF Productions. RGS or F? Uh, R is in Robert. Uh huh. G is in George. Uh huh. F is in Frank Productions. Nice. RGF. Fatty Wap the rapper, right? Oh yeah, hell yes, indeed. Have you ever seen the Fat Queen video? No, no. If you when you go look at the Fat Queen video, at the very very end, you'll see a guy at the end sitting in the car talking. At the end, 
That's my son. That's your son? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to look that up tonight. RGF Productions, right? Productions. Trap Queen. If you got a trap queen and look at the very end of the song, that's my son. But you got these little dudes that, um, these little dudes that like to stir mess up. Man. Stir mess up just like the grown ones. Just like the grown ones. Mm-hmm. So I have to be careful what I say, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they twist it up and they go back and tell myself a whole nother story. Yeah, these niggas are devils out here. Nother. These niggas are devils uh, out here. Yes, these niggas are devils out here. And they'll hate on your son. They'll hate on you just to sit up and be fucking evil. Excuse my language, but just to be evil. That's a shame, man. Disrespectful yeah. niggas. They did a move. They made a movie. They made their own little movie too. So it'll be coming on. I'll tell everybody when it's going to be there. I think they're trying to stream it on Netflix, Hulu, and wow, Hulu it's, title or something. It's a movie. I don't know. It's a movie, not a documentary, right? A movie, movie. They did a movie. Nice. This is a little movie. They did. They made up. That's fire. They, they, they did it on their own, so... I'm going to be looking it is up tonight. What it is. Well, Miss Beverly, so I tell you, it. I really enjoyed this night and this conversation. And I know... I got to go, too, because I was getting sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you yawning. I'd have been by now. I'd have been asleep by now. <laughs> I know but it's I late out there. I enjoyed it. It came out better. I had meant to be more on topic, but we'll do it again. Yes, Just indeed. Just let me know. Okay, I definitely Let's will. You know, again. you know, I'm gonna keep close contact with you in the inbox. Well, All family, right. well, family, I want y'all to enjoy this program, and we are gonna put this one on RBG Hebrew two two tonight, so that the bigger audience can see this. And Miss Beverly, I really enjoyed it, and I appreciate your time tonight. And I'll be in contact with you probably tomorrow morning, and we'll get together on this next show. And peace. All right. Peace to Miss Candy out there. All right. Go ahead. Say it again. Say it again. No, I was going to say that you can do the topic. We'll be more on topic. I got some real stuff I'd like to talk about. Right I really on. would. So right that on. Is that. Good night, everybody. All right. Have a good Bill. night. Good night, sister. Bless you. Well, y'all heard it. That was a very good show. And I am so glad I brought that sister on. And we're going to close it like this. Peace and black power.